This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash twim. This is TWIM, This Week in Microbiology, episode 245, recorded on June 24, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Well, hello there. How are you? Well, everybody, everything's good here. Good. Well... I'm in California, in Southern California, so things are good. <laughs> it's always good in Southern California. How does the song go? It never rains in Southern California. <laughs> also joining us from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Michelle Swanson. Hello. Pleasure to be I here. Just, I took a look at your environs, and I guessed at where you were, Michelle. <laughs> yeah. Did I get it right? You sure did. Very good. And from Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. Michael Schmidt, the man whose electricity went away for a brief moment. Yes. And it literally cratered every piece of technology in the house, from the doorbell so, to everything. A lightning everything. strike. A lightning, lightning strike. strike. One gigajoule well, of energy that's in amazing. a nanosecond. Um, I'm glad you're okay, Michael. I am too. Um, that's, that was, that's all that matters. That's all that matters. The, the electronics I can replace. Were you That's home right. when it happened? I was home when it happened. It must have bolted you up, right? I, I was on the phone with a colleague from Louisiana who had just met with the CEO of Exxon talking about global climate change and carbon sequestration. And he was giving me the debrief of that meeting. And literally, I heard this terrific boom. And what then happened is I heard what we're like, squirrels in the wall running <laughs> and it was the equivalent of the electrons coming up the ground wire running around killing every electronic appliance in the house and then running back to ground the it i i have never heard electricity in the walls before and wow <laughs> it it fried every arc fault breaker in the breaker box and um the electronics did what they did. They gave up the ghost and, you know, some power supplies were cooked like the 230 volt transformer that runs a central air conditioning system has a 50 amp transformer fried. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing about a different kind of energy, biological yes. photosynthesis. And they harvest more than a gigajoule of energy a day. All right, today we have two two papers for you. First, we're going to start with a snippet from Elio. Okay, doc. The title of the article gives it away. It says biosynthesis of a sulfated exopolysaccharide sinecan. That's the name of it. And bloom formation in the model cyanobacterium sinicosystis sp strain, etc. The authors are Kaisei Maeda Yukiko Okuda, Geno Onemoto, Satoru Watanabe, and Masahito Ikeuchi. They are from three different universities in Tokyo. The subject is the cyanobacteria. We haven't dealt much with cyanobacteria, so I'm going to give a two-minute introduction. They are abundant bacteria, ancient and highly versatile. They're found everywhere, in waters especially, in ponds, in lakes, everywhere. They make oxygen by photosynthesis, and they're probably the responsible for the great oxygen emergence. Way back in, uh, Michael, you would know about how much, three, two billion years ago? It sounds about okay. right. So about right. So anyhow, they are terribly important because they're found everywhere. And they are toxic because they make blooms in waters and they make toxins which are dangerous to people and dangerous to animals. You probably heard about cyanobacteria or, or uh, algal 
blooms. They were, used to be known as blue-green algae. They're not algae at all. They're bacteria. Okay. <laughs> so we'll call them cyanobacteria. And the blooms they make float. If they weren't floating, they would fall to the bottom and there would be no danger to anybody. But this way, but then they toxic. wouldn't be able to photosynthesize. Yeah, that's, that's right. right. They need to they've got to float to get the sun. Exactly right. Although they found a great depth as well, where there's no light. <laughs> so go figure. Anyhow, uh, this, uh, as the article, the title says, the um, sulfated exopolysaccharide Sinecan is responsible in part for the formation of blooms. How does this work? Well, this is an old story. Well, not exactly old. The identification of Sinecan, the sulfated exopolysaccharide, is fairly, fairly new. Anyhow, this paper is a detailed, very, very nice, very well done study of the molecular biology of the synthesis of Sinecan. So here the authors uh, are studying the genes involved. They identify all the genes involved in the biosynthesis and secretion of this molecule, Sinecan. So they figure that, uh, and they, they go over several possibilities of what makes this uh, cyanobacteria float but the most likely is what they call a flotation model, which says that they make gas vesicles, which, of course, buoy the cells up. But the Sinecan helps in uh, the production of that. It's done under conditions of high salts. They uh, absorb, Sinecan, by the way, absorbs uh, metal ions, and so iron which is our best friend among, in, among the metals, is involved here in some fashion. It's not exactly clear yet, but it will be clear very soon. Very soon. Uh, also involved are type N pili. They are somehow involved in connecting in, in the, the cells together, making them stick and then avoid by the formation of oxygen. That's about the story. The, uh, as I say, the, the molecular biology is in detail. You can read about it. I don't know that a, a great conclusion is derived from that, except that it's nice to have molecular biology at hand. So uh, cyanobacteria are important. They are universal. They are something that every microbiologist or lover of microbes should know about. That's in, in general what the article is about. It's a very, very well done article. What I really appreciated about this is they did some bioinformatics and then classical genetics where they were able to deduce a signal transduction pathway. And they had a beautiful visual assay. So you can, I, I yeah. think anybody that's teaching um, genetics and epistasis um, to uh, students uh, would find this a really pleasing way to uh, teach because of the uh, beautiful visual assays. It's quantitative. And then they march right through to uh, more sophisticated transcriptome studies to look at what the whole regulon of this um, two-component system controls. There's also a commentary associated with this article That's right. that if you're you're not into heavy duty molecular genetics and phylogeny, you may wish to look at just its first figure and and it will also be in the show notes. And what it illustrates for you is how this microbe, a blue green algae, can be a single cell, but they are noted for effectively forming, if you will, biofilms. And often these are in oceans or lakes or rivers or streams. And so it's this transition from planktonic to biofilm phase that is really some of the key insight that's provided from the molecular findings that they go through looking at the operon, looking at the regulation. And you go from the biofilm formation where everything will sink to where it then turns on the ability to make gas. And it's like, if you will, putting on your life preserver 
and jumping into the water. If you didn't have the life preserver and you just had lead weights on your legs, you would (laughs) sink. But with these gas vesicles, these floating bubbles, it brings the cyanobacteria up in the water column so that it's able to harvest the light and continue its life cycle. But, but so, if I could, if I could just ahead, interrupt Michelle. for a minute, um, it, they're not uh, the classic glass gas vessels, no, which are right. intracellular organelles. They're actually mm. trapping the CO two or the gas yeah. within this extra polysaccharide matrix. So it's it's a very cool system. They're capturing the oxygen. Remember, right, cyanobacteria right, right, right. evolve mm-hmm. oxygen. Right, right, and and even those folks who don't work on cyanobacteria should take a look at the commentary and the article because it ends up with a discussion of flocculation. And if you know anything about sewage treatment, flocculation is very important for anaerobic sludge digesters. And it it often determines the efficiency of its sewage treatment plant at being able to remediate all the things we flush. And, and so it's, it's really a very interesting paper that will help you get into understanding how something as simple as a single cell organism can actually have this complex dynamic. And again, uh, one of the neat talks that I heard at um, the recent microbe meeting that was online with FEMS and the Japanese Society was a paper out of one of Michelle's colleagues at the University of Michigan who works on cyanobacteria as well. And this is really a fascinating topic to get into. What what turns on the um, synthesis of of these carbohydrates? Is it as the as the cyanobacteria move down, it gets colder. It's a temperature trigger. Do we know? It does respond to temperature, but they didn't do an exhaustive search. It likes right. salt. Uh, I should also add. I didn't. I didn't quite say it. Sulfated uh, polysaccharides exist in animals, like mm-hmm. for instance, um, heparin sulfate. And in algae, like carrageenan, the stuff that makes ice cream, but are not found in other bacteria. This is really rare to find sulfated uh, polysaccharides. It turns out that the sulfated polysaccharides themselves are toxic, and uh, they're, they're interesting. They're really interesting molecules that are not just involved in the flotation of the cyanobacteria. So they're really interesting compounds, and I think we're going to hear much more about it. Um, yeah, and, and to your point, Ilio, um, I like that they framed this paper in talking about how these um, polysaccharides made by bacteria are actually already used in industry, in the food industry, in um, industrial right. materials, medicines. And um, they point out that now that they have tamed, if you will, this particular um, cyanobacterium, they think it's going to be a great model system for better understanding how to make these sulfated um, polysaccharides. So it's, it's, it goes from like the elegant biology, but also application. And carrageenan, the one protein that Elio mentioned, is what gives ice cream its mouthfeel. You know, mm-hmm. that smooth texture. It's not the cream. It's that sulfonated material that gives it its delightful, smooth mouthfeel associated with it without they, using they did more than that, by the way. Uh, sulfonated uh, compounds seem to, be, uh, seem to be involved as antiviral anti-tumor and anti-inflammatory. So they have very positive uses besides ice cream. (laughs) There's interesting stuff, but they're not made by any other bacteria than the cyanobacteria. Hmm. So they they identify an operon that has all these genes for biosynthesis. So there has to be some trigger to turn it on. We don't really know what that is. They show that actually low temperature inhibits the the induct transcriptional right. induction, so that maybe as the bacteria sink, you want to turn off the production of this. I don't know, but what gets it back on? That's my question, and maybe well, some of it is good. oxygen. The, yeah. Oxygen is a bubble, floats, 
The bacteria mm. stick to that and they float along with it. When these bacteria are out of the, the range of sun, they're, they're out of the photic zone, how do they uh, produce energy, do you know? They eat carbon. They they eat, eat the store. They eat the stored energy that they 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 don't no longer divide. Remember, the cyanobacteria okay. Okay. can also fix nitrogen, and in fact, mm-hmm. the heterocyst associated with the cyanobacteria is a strict anaerobe, and it doesn't do any photosynthesis. Okay. It excludes itself from oxygen. Very, very well. Okay. And so they're so once they're out of light, they're not doing any more synthesis. They subsist on what's stored, and then the the idea is that eventually they get back into light. And how they get up there, I is gas. I'm getting that we don't know. Well, they make gas at the bottom. Well, no, they they make gas from the oxygen, and again, as they consume carbon and energy, they'll also make hydrogen and CO two. They, mm-hmm. you know, gas comes off both ways, both. Fixing the energy, you evolve oxygen because water is the electron donor. And then when you consume the glucose you produced, then uh, hydrogen and CO2 are the waste products. But to your point, Vincent, they they didn't go into um, looking at the signal that turns on this two-component regulatory system in the operon. But as as I was thinking about that, I realized... Back in my day, this would have been three different papers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and for them to lay it all out in one paper was really, uh, really a lovely That's story. Right. And again, I think anybody that is teaching this biology, um, consider using this as a uh, basis for your class. Yeah, it's great. Okay. Thank you, Elio. My pleasure. All right, Michael, what do you have for us? I have a paper from MBio. It's entitled, The Bacterial Symbiote Protects Honeybees from Fungal Disease. It's by the authors Miller, Smith, and Newton, and they're all from the Department of Biology at Indiana University, Bloomington. IU is my alma mater, Hmm. or translating from the Latin, was my nourishing foster mother. (laughs) <laughs> you want to uh, say it again? My nourishing foster mother. That's what the Latin translation is. needs one. <laughs> Alma mater. So this paper uh, will help us understand the world of bees. And again, appreciate that bees are responsible for nourishing the world, being responsible for over one third of the for- fertilization of our food crops. So without honeybees, there is no food. In the show notes, I have placed a link to a phenomenal TED Talk. If you have not yet discovered this YouTube channel, TED Talks, it's a daily video podcast of the best talks and performances from TED conferences, where the world's leading thinkers and doers give a talk of their lives in less than 18 minutes. And Anan Varma from Berkeley gave this talk in six minutes on where he raised bees in his backyard in front of a camera. And this project was sponsored by the National Geographic. And it gives us a lyrical glimpse into a beehive and reveals one of the biggest threats to honeybees that many of our listeners have heard about, namely the Asian mite that is causing honeybee colony collapse. Uh, that preys on bees in the first 21 days of their life. I'm introducing it to us because we're going to be talking about a bacterial symbiotic relationship where the larval to pupil stage is infected by a fungus and the bacterial symbiosis that is going on in this cocoon, if you will, by a bacterium actually will kill the fungus. So you get to see what the bee is experiencing in this video. So you get to watch what we're going to be talking about. And so I thought it would be a a pretty cool thing to to look at how a bee is formed. I had never seen it before, and I was just mesmerized. (laughs) Well, now back to the paper. In addition to the stress of mites, the poor honeybees have to contend with another significant stressor. Namely, they also need to do battle with fungal pathogens, which negatively impact on their productivity and their population size. And this impacts particularly in this brood stage, the first 21 days of a bee's life, hence me digging out the cool movie. Today's story is principally what the title offers. 
how a bacterial symbiote can serve to protect this keystone species of our food crops, as well as our terrestrial ecology from fungal disease. Now, here the authors examined the capacity of a honeybee-associated bacterium, Bombella apis, to suppress the growth of fungal Have you pathogens. ever heard of it before? Never. <laughs> Never. <laughs> so, so Bombella... <laughs> Did you name the authors? Yes. I said it was uh, Miller, Smith, and Newton. So Bombella apis is a gram-negative, strictly aerobe, non-spore-forming, rod-shaped, non-modal bacterium, which has been isolated from the mid-gut of a bee. So this is an aerobe in the mid-gut. Normally, we think of bacteria in mid-guts of insects as being strict anaerobes. So this is a little bit off topic, if you will. So here, they're examining this bacterium to suppress the growth of fungal pathogens. Ultimately, around the central hypothesis that they, this bacterium may then be able to protect the bee brood from an infection. They learned in, their, in the story that we're going to reveal that this bacterium, Bombella, was able to suppress the growth of fungal pathogens, and ultimately, we hope to be able to protect the colony from infection. From their introduction, I learned to my surprise that among insects, fungal pathogens are currently the most common causal agent of disease and historically have plagued insects for over 300 million years. I would have guessed if someone put a gun to my head, that it would have been bacteria, but no, it's fungi. How they arrive at the 300 million year number, I need to investigate further. But what they offer, and what many longtime listeners of this program will likely jump to, is that insects have developed strategies to combat these pesky fungi. They have done it through their advancements to their immune system, behavioral modifications, and what we'll witness here today this close microbial symbiotic relationship. They also offer that the honeybee is an excellent model system in which to investigate fungus host symbiotes interactions because the honeybee worker, that, that bee that's flying from fo- pollen to pollen, co- flower to flower, collecting pollen and nectar, um, interacts with the environment through its foraging behavior, bringing pollen, which may be contaminated or may be harboring fungi and bacteria, back to the colony. In recent years, we've seen a drastic population decline to honeybees that have been reported as a result of a combination of stressors, including the mites in that opening video, as well as leading to these opportunistic fungi fungal infections. Like most life, if you think about it, the bee is no different than man. It's most susceptible while it's developing. This and, and the development of the bee, this is termed the brood phase. It's here where the egg hatches and forms a larval stage that then feeds and then it pupates when they are exposed to these fungal pathogens. And the fungal pathogen is something called Ascopharia apis. Uh, and this is the fungal cause of honeybee larval disease called chalk brood. Spores of this fungus will germinate within the digestive tracts of bees. Then they begin mycelial growth during the last instar phase of larval development. And then the dead larvae and pupil bees appear chalky. And again, another reason I wanted you to see the video. And they, they, you just get this mycelia growing. These chalky mummies are then highly infectious. And you can well imagine if mites are running around, they're bringing spores everywhere in that hive and they're reinfecting the colonies. Uh, sterile areas and they're infecting food supplies. They're transporting it directly to the young. So it's really a crazy scenario. That's Ascopharia apis. 
They can also be infected with Aspergillus flavus. And this is one of the organisms that they use in their test study here. And many of us have heard of Aspergillus flavus as its uh, species name denotes. It was named flavus because its spores are yellow in color. And we also know them because they produce uh, significant quantities of toxic compounds known as mycotoxins, which you know, are pretty bad for people like us. So the honeybees are, the honeybee broods are reared on a larval diet that is colonized by a few bacterial species. And when you hear the species, you sort of guess what's going on here. We have Bombella, which, we, which we've already talked about. We have Lactobacillus, which implies low pH. And we ha- also have Fructobacillus, and again, it's eating fructose, which is probably uh, in the uh, food that the bee is being fed, and infrequently a bifidobacterium. Now, the central hypothesis that these microbes, the, 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 these acidogenic microbes, will play a defensive role in honeybee brood development. Now, the honeybee workers or the nursing bees – harbor a different microbiota than the brood and their susceptibility to various pathogens correlates with changes to their microbiome composition and abundance. Now this is an old but familiar microbiome type stories. And so in essence, the honeybee associated microbiota have profound impacts on disease outcomes, which may be mediated by the presence or absence of key players. And so therefore, by extension, it's possible that the brood-associated microbes may play a similar defensive role. Enter the most prevalent brood-associated bacterium, this Bombella apis, this acetic acid bacterium that's been found in association with nectar and royal jelly. No, this is not the marmalade the Queen of England eats, but rather it's a (laughs) honeybee secretion that is used in the nutrition of larvae and adult queens. It's secreted from the glands in the hypopharynx of nurse bees and fed to all larvae in the colony, regardless of their sex or caste. So we now know Bombella is everywhere within the colony, from the larva to the queen's gut. But the worker hypo pharyngeal glands and nectar stores is also where it's found. What I found intriguing or confirmatory that their hypothesis was really going down the right track was many of the niches that Bombella colonized, particularly the larva, are susceptible to fungal infection and or contamination. So that the Bombella being localized to these niches strongly suggests a potential protective role. The final piece, and this this is from previous published work, is that in honeybees adults, an increased concentration of Bombella is negatively correlated with the presence of nosema, a fungal pathogen of the adult bee. So how did they test their hypothesis? Step one, we examined the potential for Bombella to inhibit fungal establishment both in vitro and in vivo using an infection assay in laboratory-reared broods. The in vitro test is very elegant. It's an inhibition assay where they literally paint Bombella on a Petri plate, and then they inoculate about a 1,000 spores across the lawn of the Bombella, and they ask the question, what grows? The number of spores produced by both Bombella, uh, b- the number of spores produced by the fungal pathogens um, was reduced by an order of magnitude on average compared to the controls without the Bombella, showing that the Bombella can suppress the growth of both pathogens. 
And Michael, if I could just jump in, one thing I loved about this paper is they really make it very accessible to the reader. So they've got a lovely cartoon schematic showing you how they designed the experiment. Then they give you the visual of what they saw when they went into the incubator the next day and looked at the plates. And then, of course, they've got the quantitative data with the statistics. So it's really beautiful. It's one of these things that why you get into science. You don't want to make it a mystery or a Henry novel of how you arrive at your conclusion. You literally follow along with the authors as they test their hypothesis. So now we're going to go in vivo. And it's it's also a great way to earn the reader's trust. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know they're not BSing you with, you know, uh, bioinformatics or something. That- and they're not trying to outsmart you. They're trying to make it accessible. Yes. So we're now going in vivo. They collect larvae from their apiary. They rear them on a larval diet supplemented with either bumbella or sterile control. Once the larvae have reached a pupate stage, they then contaminate or inoculate the larva slash pupa with an aspergillus or a sterile MRS control. An MRS is Daman, Ragusa, and Sharp Auger, which is a selective medium designed to favor the luxuriant growth of lactobacilli, but it also will probably promote the growth of Bombella. Now, the presence of infection was scored until the bee reached adulthood. That's where they sprout hair and, and do all the things bees are supposed to do. <laughs> Pupae that were supplemented with the bumbella as larvae were significantly more likely to resist fungal infection. They give us the chi-square value of 14.8. And remember, the easy way to think of chi-square, the bigger the number, the bigger the difference between the two groups. And the two groups were bumbella and no bumbella. And so the p-value was 0.001. And and to your point, um, she didn't have to do the chi-square analysis. Um, When she walked into the lab that morning and looked at the plates, she said it was one of the most exciting um, days of the project, that she saw almost no infected pupa when they were supplemented with this symbiont. She was so excited, and she realized this research really could lead to a new um, antifungal therapy that could protect our bees. So Michelle is taking us to the how part. We already have data that suggests that the presence of this um, bacterial symbiote increases the bee's likelihood of survival under a fungal challenge while decreasing. And this is what was inferred from some of their, their data while decreasing the pathogen spore, spore load of fungi and potential spread within the colony to new host. And they again had a number of Bombella apius strains and they saw this, this value repeated with the same significant result. But the how part. Now they offer a hypothesis that the mechanism by which this uh, micro protects the brood is through the secretion of an antifungal metabolite. Again, um, in a similar type of experiment that was done back in my day at IU by a graduate student by the name of Karen Steven and, and Dave White's lab, who she was working on Stigmatella arantiaca, they too conducted a spent medium experiment. So again, Bombella's making something that it's throwing out into the medium that is killing the fungus. So we're going to look at spent medium. So the hypothesis is that the antifungal metabolite would likely be contained within the spent medium. If you will, any metabolic byproducts that are being thrown across the transom is from the metabolism of the bombella. Again, the experiment, fungal isolates were either cultured in fresh medium in addition to spent medium from bombella apius cultures or in fresh medium alone. They normalized their data across strains and cultures, uh, and they diluted it. They give us this beautiful flow chart so you know what they have done. You can follow this along. It's not any great mystery that growth of both 
the two fungi that kill the the brooding bee was significantly reduced by spent medium alone, where the anti-metabolite is likely present. So this suggests that spent medium has something in it sufficient to suppress fungal growth. To eliminate the possibility that it was a biophysical thing, that the bacteria are just simply dropping the pH to a point where the fungi can't survive, they adjust it by buffering it to pH 5, and aspergillus grows perfectly well at pH 5, and the pH had no significant effect on the ability of the spent medium to impede the growth of the fungus. So now you ask, what's the antifungal? So here we get a little bit of in silico analysis. They used a program called anti-smash or the antibiotic and secondary metabolite analysis shell to search for possible loci within the bombella genome that could contribute to their understanding of what this metabolite that would inhibit fungi might be. So anti-smash, I put a reference in the show notes, it's from nucleic acid research. So if you want to learn about anti-smash for bacteria and fungi, you can check it out. What they found is that the genomes of all of their Bombella strains encoded a conserved type one polyketide synthase gene cluster. And polyketide synthases are common amongst host-associated microbes and produce an antibiotic that some of you might be familiar with, macrolides. And a good example of a macrolide is erythromycin and moxifloxacin and other things. And macrolides often have fun- antifungal activities. Now, two more experiments were performed to characterize the antifungal metab properties. Here, spent medium was treated either with a protease or heat. So again, we're asking the question, is the anti-metabolite a small peptide or is it a protein? And heat and proteases, of course, will eliminate that possibility. And it, that those two, that experiment was not found to diminish this antifungal effect, which is suggestive that the antifungal is not a protein or a, a peptide in nature. The antibiotic secondary metabolite analysis shell also elaborated two other gene clusters um, that were potential antimicrobials, but it's unlikely. One was an airy, aerial polyene, which is uh, transported to the membrane, so it's not going to get out. And the second was a terpene, Again, a component most likely associated with the bacterial membrane. So ultimately, it leaves us with the question, will this work in nature? While their experiments conclusively show that Bombellus secretes this antifungal metabolite, can it protect bees from fungal infection? In other However, words, can we use it as a probiotic? Right. Can we make certain that we have enough in our hives to get things going? But I'm afraid that we'll screw up the royal jelly and, and because, you know, it's, it's that, that right balance of those five acidogenic bacteria in harmony that's probably protecting the brood. You just can't dump in a whole bunch of bombella because you may change the the flavor. So that's the story. I've not been back to IU since I I graduated in in 1985, but I keep up with their comings and going via their newsletter. And I thought this would be a a great story. Again, I I seem to be stuck on this food arc, but um, it's it's a neat story. And uh, this is a really elegant and approachable paper for everyone to get through. I agree. And this is the work of Delaney Miller. She is a graduate student with Irene Newton in um, at 
Indiana University. Um, she is from New Mexico, and she got her bachelor's degree in biology at the New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology. And she, at the time, she was interested in conservation biology, and so she sought out um, a research project. She worked with uh, Jamie Vole for a couple of years, studying a fungal pathogen that I will try to pronounce. You can correct me, Ilio, if you if you know this one, Batrachochytrium dendrobatitis, or something like that. So that gave her really a great appreciation for microbiology. She knew she want, wanted to learn more and really pursue this interest. So um, that led her to Indiana University, where she's continuing to study um, kind of applied microbiology, if you will. She said it's been awesome working in Irene's lab. Um, she is really appreciative for her mentor's um, excitement and support. And the whole research group, she said, has been really um, supportive, cheering her on. She also is really thankful to her lab mate, Audrey Parrish, who spends every field season uh, with Delaney out in the bee yard. And she has included uh, her website link, which I put in the show notes, and she's got some photos of the bee yard um, there at Indiana University. And uh, she had to, of course, first learn how to develop um, skills to rear larvae um, from the bees in order to do these beautiful experiments. Um, she also, on her website, has included a number of outreach resources. So she's got some videos um, that introduce you to um, honeybee development, how they study it in the lab, um, YouTube videos. She's also got some coloring pages um, for that, that describe um, honeybee life in hives. And what really impresses me is she's got a place on her website where if you are in the region and you're interested in some local science outreach, um, she, she's got a way that you can contact her, send a message, and she is interested in, um, in you know, paying it forward, sharing her um, knowledge and, and love of this microbiology with, um, with others. So um, asked if she had any advice for more junior trainees, she said, if there's one thing I could say, it's that you belong here. The first couple graduate years of graduate school can be um, difficult. They can be full of insecurity. Some people get imposter syndrome, but she says, rest assured, you deserve to be here. So um, yeah, I, I direct you to her website to learn more about her interesting science. Uh, when she's not thinking about bees and microbes, she's also an artist and she enjoys incorporating the art into her presentations. And again, I think that really um, is apparent from the really beautiful schematics that they've included to describe each of their experiments. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah. Michael, um, is this part of the loss of B. apis and the fungal infection, is that part of the overall disease colony collapse disorder? I think it must be because the mites are one factor involved in it. And yeah. if, if you listen to the full six minutes of the TED Talk, they talk about how the USDA is investigating honeybee collapse and they're trying to breed mite-resistant bees hmm. in Louisiana. And what they've learned is that while you're able to breed mite resistant bees, they lose their ability to collect pollen as efficiently as the more <laughs> gentle species. And they become much more nasty. And, uh, so they don't, they don't like being tinkered with so much. And, and so I think it's this, you know, the mite is an introduced pest to mm. the honeybees of, of Europe. It's an Asian mite. Yeah, and yeah. so consequently, I think it's a combination of we're using pesticides in the, the farmers or the, the apiaries have been trying to combat honeybee collapse by using insecticides to control the mites, but that may also be changing the microbiome uh, yeah. because yeah. you may be doing subtle things. So I think, that's why you have to consider things holistically and sure. why looking at the microbiome, the way they approached it, looking at the species, doing these carefully controlled experiments, looking at pH and other things really teaches the reader how you have to be careful. You just can't dump a bunch of Bombella in to save mm -hmm. the bees. Michael, that experiment of making bees Mite resistant. That is a gain of function experiment. Mm. Yes. <laughs> I just want people to know that 
many things we do are gain of function. It's not a bad word. That That is true, Vincent. And, <laughs> and <laughs> that's going on as we speak in Louisiana on U.S. soil. Of course. Um, and there's always a trade-off. You, you have one property acquired and something else changes because we are not nature. We cannot beautifully balance everything. Or predict. Or, or predict even, yes, for sure. Uh, Vincent, anyway. Vincent. Yes. Do we have a couple of extra minutes today? Sure. Go ahead. Uh, I would like to bring up a paper that has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with this week in virology. Uh -oh. It's a paper which purports to measure the weight of all the coronaviruses that are infecting people. Have you seen that? <laughs> I've it's heard of it, group, yes. It's by a group that loves numbers. Uh, Evidently. Ron Milo in Israel, Ron Phillips at Caltech in their bodies. They like numbers. They like numbers of everything. So they calculated the total number and mass of the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. And the, the answer is that we have uh, in every infected person has about between one and a hundred billion and the mass of that is no more than a tenth of a milligram. Wow. So if you want to uh, yeah. figure out what is the total mass of all the coronaviruses around, it's between 100 grams and 10 kilograms. That's mm -hmm. the answer. Across the so globe. It doesn't even I, make I, one I person. Was cute. It has nothing to do with what we're talking about, but I think it's cute that somebody bothers to figure this out. That's very Are good. you going to do this on virology? On this week in virology, okay. well, I think my, we might mention it. I think it's worth it. Yeah, you can send them an email, Ilio, and then they'll they'll be obligated to respond. <laughs> Wonderful, <laughs> love it. Yeah, it doesn't take much, does it? It doesn't take much. It it reminds me of that experiment of how many M and M's are in a jar. Yeah, and and how you calculate that at the fair or jelly beans in a jar, uh, but they they've given away the secret. All right, two quick emails, one from Peter. I haven't looked up the academic literature on this yet, but it seems fungi may both increase agricultural yields and sequester carbon. When I saw fungi, I immediately thought of Alio, and he provides a link uh, to an article. Are dark septate endophytes a species that forms microphily? Thanks for your efforts, Pete from Sydney, Australia. So the article is... Soil carbon scientists explore fungi to enlist crop farmers in battle against climate change. Hmm. So not only the bees, Michael, are using uh, fungi. Yes. <laughs> we are as well. Well, I mean, it, it makes sense. And um, anytime you can sequester carbon uh, on this planet where we like to burn everything, yeah. it can only be a help. <laughs> Uh-huh. Yes, are dark septate endophytes a species that forms microphily? Does anyone know what that means? I don't. Dark septate endophytes, Michael, no? Dark it's it's an operational definition. They're 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 living on air. Mhm. Mm I mean, that's what endophytic and so these are fungi that are just pulling out things out of the air. Okay. And they're dark because they're not cyanobacteria or or photosynthesizing. Okay. And lastly, from Scott Deer Twim Host, thank you for sharing the link to Microtalks. I emailed after 227. You shared a paper from Floyd Warmly's group about immunity to cryptococcosis. Floyd Warmly gave a talk about his group's work at the most recent Microtalks. Here's a YouTube link to the talk. This virtual seminar features two speakers a month. So it also includes a talk from Neil Gao, who gives a talk about signaling across the fungal cell wall. Here's the link for Michael Talks to access all past and future talks. Wow. A day of fungi, right? Yeah. They're underappreciated for sure, both in health and disease. Yes. All right. That'll do it for TWIM245. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIM. If you like our work, consider supporting us, microbe.tv slash contribute. And if you'd like to ask a question or comment on something we've talked about, twim at microbe.tv.
Michelle Swanson's at the University of Michigan. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, and stay stay safe. I guess, yeah, we're we're all safer now than we were six months ago, aren't we? Enjoy the weather. Yes, we're mm-hmm. doing very well. We're very lucky because not all of the world is. Right. No. Elio Schechter's at Small Things Consider. Thank you, Elio. My pleasure. Thank you. Michael Schmidt's at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everyone. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society of Microbiology for their support of TWIM and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIM was edited by Ray Ortega. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology.